Hey everybody. Hey everybody. Welcome to another episode of Design Recharge. I'm your host Diane Gibbs and I teach at the University of South Alabama graphic design. And I've also been a designer for almost 20 years now and I do this show to hopefully help other designers connect, get inspired, motivated and um, I think it's great for us to bring people on, fine artists, um, lawyers, anybody who's going to help us with our business stuff. So today I have my good friend Megan Moore, who is a printmaker here at South and she, the printmaking professor. And, but she also, I mean, she's doing different things with printmaking. I love how she's solving problems. And she and I always have these great conversations in regards to design and how we're doing stuff. So today I get to ask her all the kinds of questions I haven't asked her before. So <laughs> Megan is from California originally, so you want to give us a little background uh, how you got all the way to Alabama? Sure, sure. So I did my undergraduate at uh, University, of Santa, uh, University of California at Santa Barbara. Um, I was a photography major and a communication major, and I, I didn't really find printmaking until like halfway through my, my stay at Santa Barbara. Um, I should have been a printmaker the whole time. I like getting messy. I like getting dirty. I like being in a studio. I don't like being in the dark. Um, it just was a, a better fit for me. Um, so I graduated in 2004 with my undergraduate. I uh, went to LA for a couple years. I'm not meant to be in LA. And then I moved home to Chico. And that, when I was at Chico, I started working in a studio there, a printmaking studio. And eventually I got into the graduate program in Chico State. So I I did that. Um, and then, you know, you graduate and you look for jobs. And my first job was a sabbatical replacement position at Humboldt State, where all the redwoods grow in California. And while I was there, I just applied to this job and it happened to be in Alabama. <laughs> and I just happened to get it. Um, so I, I trekked out here and a year later, almost a year later, I'm, I'm still here. So far. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> and in this year, you've also had tons of shows. You've had make awesome work, um, really big pieces. You make a little bit smaller pieces now, not tiny at all, but yeah. much smaller than what you were working. So do you want to talk just a little bit about that? And then um, we'll kind of transition into some of the pieces that you're going to show us today. Yeah, um, when I was doing my thesis show at Chico State, I was working big. Um, the small pieces were four feet tall by about three and a half feet wide. The big pieces were closer to seven feet tall or seven feet wide. Um, and I love these big pieces. I, in fact, I've got a piece of paper stretched at home ready to work on the new big piece. But they're big, they're huge, and there's storage problems. There's um, creation problems you know how do you work on a piece that's bigger than you are and keep it clean and keep it white you know because it's white paper um, so I started working on small pieces when I right when I landed in Alabama I started working on pieces that were maybe eight, this small uh, you know seven eight inches compared to seven or eight feet and it was just so that I could get my arms around it um, you know, I had been working big for so long, I needed to do something more manageable. Um, I do have some other sizes, like some 22 inches by 30 inch sizes, um, which are, that's like a big full sheet of paper. And for printmakers, that, that's big, but um, those are like my medium small sizes, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, because so it's just big convenient. Are, your big pieces they're, are big. They're pretty big. I'm. Now a couple of years into it, I'm much better at handling them. I can actually move them on my own. But when I first started working at this size, I couldn't move them by myself. Like I needed a partner every time I wanted to move them around. And when they're they're taped down to a big board so that I can keep them flat, I can't move the board by myself. It always takes a buddy, which is weird because I work by myself more of the time. But seems to work out. Seems to be getting better at it. Well, that's good. And so you got a solo or a, you've been in a lot of shows this past year. I don't know how many, but you tell me and I'm like amazed because you're <laughs> working full time and then you're doing, but you just got it. I think it's a solo show or it's a 
I don't know, the one you got into at Brown, isn't that right? Yeah, so I show anywhere from 12 to 16 times a year. I think in this last year at, at Alabama, I showed about 15 times and two two-person shows. I've got a solo show at Brown University coming up in October, so I'm working on that. Um, that will have a lot of my older pieces, and like in the last two years, along with some newer pieces that I've been working on in the last year and and trying to make now. Hopefully, we'll finish by October. But yeah, should be a mix. So, so when how long can you show a piece? I always wonder about that. I wonder about that all the time. Um, <laughs> I'm, because <laughs> I'm stubborn, I want to be able to show new work at every single show I have. That's impossible. Um, so <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work. Especially with this job. Yeah, I've got a job and trying to have a life, it just doesn't work out. And um, two years seem to be like my max because they're so big, because they take me so long. I feel like two years is, is actually an okay lifespan. Um, the, the smaller pieces I'll only show like when they're six months old and I don't really show them beyond that. Um, I think two years, I'm not sure. I've got a couple pieces that have been getting into jury pieces for about uh, five years now, four years. And I don't know why, they're just a little bit more popular than the others and I, I just let them go. I let them, <laughs> if they want to travel, they get to travel. Um, they have a life they of their like own. To travel. Yes, they like to travel. So, they travel more than I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but there's really not, you're still printing, you're cutting, you, and I want you to get talked about your process a little bit. And I'm going to bring up a piece that you said was a really big piece, but this is a zoomed in. And if you're yeah. new to Spreecast, um, all you have to do is this big image pops in front of our screen, and you can actually drag your mouse off of it and then put it back on it and then adjust it so you can still see Megan talking or you can put it over my face or over the chat window or whatever. And if you're a guest, you probably can't do too much. You can't type in, but all you have to do is register for a free Spreecast account. And you do that just with an email address or it's even simpler if you do it with your Facebook or Twitter account, but you don't have to do that if you don't want to. You just use your email address. So, um, so I just wanted to get you that. But what's the difference between you working really huge and and really small. Are you still using the same cutting process or are you using bigger piece, bigger cut outs? I, the, the big pieces are more traditional collage. So I will actually cut something out of a piece of paper and glue it on to a bigger piece of paper. Um, but they're not necessarily bigger pieces. I'm working on a piece right now that's gonna be about six feet tall and the pieces are like this big. So they're not, you know, that's a lot of tiny little pieces to fill a, a six foot tall piece or piece of paper. Um, but they do get bigger. Sometimes they're up to eight inches. Sometimes they're, you know, seven or six inches. And then I just layer on top of that. This piece that we're looking at here, the overall piece is about seven feet tall. And this is a close up. Each one of those leaves is about three to four inches long, approximately. These are a lot, these take a long time, especially the bigger ones. They take a, a tremendous amount of time, partly because I can't, um, I don't like to commit. <laughs> so I'll, I'll glue a piece down and then change my mind and then glue a piece down and then change my mind. So I, I take like four steps forward and two back and, you know, it, it takes me, a, it takes me a while. And then I'm also, so all the outline pieces or all the outlines that you see are the print itself that I've cut out of a piece of paper. But uh, once I've glued that down, I'll go back and I'll, I'll color it in either with watercolor or um, colored pencil. So I'll, I'm kind of pasting down and um, coloring in, pasting down and coloring in, and then also you know changing my mind as I go along. Uh, so it takes so me if it takes you, me a while. If you glued it down, how what are you using so that you can take it up? I use wheat paste. It's um. It's a natural paste. It's not doesn't have any kind of um, plastics in it. It's made from wheat, uh, made from flour, um, but it's 100% reversible. And this is why museums often use it for their book binding. Um, all I have to do is soak the paper in water, and the pieces come back up. Uh, even though I'm printing on a very delicate Japanese paper, I mean, the 
pieces are so light, they're like um, tissue paper or like a spent dryer sheet. You know that how that dryer sheet when it comes out of the dryer is so thin? The paper is a lot like that, but it's pretty resilient. So even though I've spritzed it with water and pulling it up off a piece of paper, it will pop up right back up. It'll be fine. So have you always worked in collage or is this something you came into and what kind of attracted you to work in this way? I think in my undergrad, I did little things in collage. I've always kind of tinkered with collage, you know, not consciously, just on my own time, doing my own thing. I've always been a collage artist. When, right before I started in grad school, when I was working at Chico State, my, my teacher said, you know, you always do collage. Why is this? This isn't a surprise. <laughs> you always do this. And it wasn't until then that I said, oh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. Um, almost everything I do now is collage. I would say 98% of all the work I make is collage work. It's just how I think. I, you know, some people can draw, some people can um, paint a picture from scratch, you know, blank canvas to full canvas. I can't do that. I have to cut things apart and take them apart and re-put them back together. It's just, it's just how I make work. It's very so do natural. You have, do you do you start with a sketch or do you have an idea or like you have all these sketches that you've done and then you've you've made them into a plate can you kind of talk about that part like how do you, how, what part makes you a printmaker because really this is like collage so yeah talk about Absolutely. how how it's printmaking every every piece that i make into a print i've sketched so i sketch and sketch and sketch um I sketch until the cows come home, and then I'll take a couple of those sketches and I'll make them into printmaking plates. I use etching plates. I'll do quite a bit of etching, quite a bit of lithography, and I'm using some new um, photopolymer printmaking where it's a more of a digital process. Um, so I, I use these three types of printmaking, and I just print hundreds. I print hundreds and hundreds of sheets, and actually, I've got a sample sheet. Of course, it's all crinkled because it's been in my bag, but so it might look like this. See all those little tiny bits on it? So I've this is off of a printmaking plate, and I've printed all of these little dudes that I'll now cut up and collage onto a bigger piece. So I'm, I still consider myself a printmaker. I use all these different printmaking techniques to make my paper or make my paper pieces but they're not the final result. The final result is usually the collage piece that I've done later. And some, In like I of, have a piece, a piece that you did that was just a, um, yeah, a, the one litho, piece. Uh, the crayon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I do do them occasionally, especially for demos, especially for um, portfolio pieces. Like if I'm going to participate in a, portfolio exchange where I'm exchanging with other artists, I'll do a, a regular printmaking um, image because that way I can reproduce it exactly each time. Um, mm -hmm. That's when I need, you know, 10 pieces to look exactly the same, 10 finished pieces to look exactly the same. My bigger collage work, there's only one. You know, I can't, I can't reproduce that. There's too many little dudes on them to do that more than once it would not be fun <laughs> so it looks like sometimes you're changing colors so like you've printed um in like a gray or something and then sometimes you change the same little shape or, like, or paper yeah. shape yeah when i print so if i'm like let's say that i'm printing these dudes mm -hmm. i'll print them in like let's just say i just printed them in green or this teal color uh, then I'll print them in blue, and then I'll print them in different, you know, different shades in between. I'll print them in gray. I'll print them in a wide range of colors so that when I get to my collage work, I have a bigger arsenal of what I can use. And I don't plan ahead what the final pieces are going to be. Um, those I tend to let kind of grow on their own. So I need to have a lot of options. You know, I don't know if I'm going to need dark black pieces or really light, flimsy kind of colors that will fade into the background. So I need the wide range before I can even start collaging. 
And in terms and of don't... which... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So you don't always just have a, like, this drawing is only going to be for this. Like, you'll do this drawing, and then you'll print a bunch, and you'll use it in a bunch of different pieces. Yeah, because if I'm going to print a couple hundred of them and cut a couple hundred of them out, I want to be able to use them whenever I want, wherever I want. So they're, when I'm making printmaking plates, they're rarely just for a specific piece in mind. So and the picture, oof, the picture that you have up right now, those are all baggies of printed pieces that I have kind of OCD like cut out and put in the baggies and I put them up on the wall so that I can I can see that I have. Um, and I sometimes I'll just make plates for weeks, just weeks and weeks and weeks of images of leaves of stuff that I'm going to use later. And I have absolutely no idea when I'm going to use them in a collage, but eventually they kind of make their way to the surface and they make their way in. Um, and I think I can spend weeks making pieces with no purpose until you know, I think two years later. <laughs> I think designers could use that same mentality of just doing some things that we like, like, and John wants to know about the printmaking process and we're going to get there. So first I want you to answer Laurie's question. Do you hand color the pieces? Hi mom. <laughs> yes, I do hand color the pieces. Um, the the line work, the ink work is printmaking ink, and so I choose the color there. And then occasionally I print on a specific colored paper, so I might print on a pink paper or a yellow paper. Most of the time, what I'm doing is I'm I'm hand coloring. So any of the the vibrant color you're seeing is from me using color pencil or watercolor, um, doing it by hand. Again, that gives me more options. Um, as I'm collaging, you know, if I've got all these pieces and they're all green and I really want something orange, that's not as helpful. So I'll, I'll print them in one color, but then I can change them with watercolor or, or color pencil later on. And I like to change my mind a lot. So that, I like to have as many, like, options to get out of something as, as possible. <laughs> and I think, so can you talk about maybe how the printmaking process and how graphic designers can use this idea of image making, but also just the collage process? How, like to me, I think of all these different ways and I think, you know, some people think better with lots of little pieces that they're gonna continually use. And, and some people are like, no, this isn't gonna work for me. But I also think it's just a way to push yourself if this isn't a natural way of working. So, but can you kind of address yeah. that one? You know, I, I think artists and graphic designers should have a, a toolbox of things that they can pull from all the time. And for me, I make my own toolbox. I make the images I'm going to use, the textures I'm going to use, the colors I'm going to use, and I have them ready to go. A graphic, a graphic designer could do absolutely the same thing, um, whether it's hand drawing a certain texture that you don't know when you're going to use, but you'll use it later or a certain patterning or even a framework for a publication that might be a little bit different. Um, sometimes we just need to make stuff even if we don't have a, a purpose for them later on. I also think a lot of, or at least my, a lot of my graphic designer students will go out and look for things to fit a certain design profile. I say they make it. You know, they are they have drawing skills and they have color skills. Go ahead and make it yourself. Scan it in and then it's a little bit more unique to the project, it's a little bit more specific to the project. But then they also have that that benefit of having done something by hand that it's fun that way, I think. But you know. <laughs> and even just cutting it out, you're physically you sit up and you watch movies and you cut out your shapes. So right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll just sit there. I'll sit so, in coffee shops, watching movies, just cutting <laughs> for hours on it. <laughs> so designers could do the same thing. Like, why can't we cut up our tight? I mean, obviously not little bitty, you know, eight point tight, but why couldn't we cut out our, you know, our headlines? And, and why don't we push ourselves to do different things? And it's the same thing to me. You're making these little very... Um, organic um, botanical kind of shapes we could do the same thing with type or or like you're saying like if, like background textures you know it could be stripes that we physically cut out and 
I think sometimes it makes us because we're messing with it on paper makes it um, we think differently. So yeah, I don't know if I, that answered your question, John. I, I definitely think I think differently when I'm on the computer versus in you know in my own hands. But I I use both. I use Photoshop and I use you know paper and ink and traditional like handheld materials. But I think the important thing is on both places I have a really large library of things that I like that I'm drawn to and that I could use later on both on my computer and in you know the real world and it, that library is is extremely valuable to me it having that library allows me to do all the things that I do so I'm always having to work at building my own library whether it's a, a skill library a library of images a library of prints a library of plates Sometimes it's just a library of things that inspire me that I can draw from later on. I think graphic so, designers and, and artists can use that both and they should. Oh, definitely. So I so it seems I mean like with other printmakers I know and I don't know a ton, so but it seems like you're very unique because you just embrace the digital because some pieces are completely collaged in Photoshop. And mm -hmm. then some pieces are all done pretty much by hand. Yes. So can you talk about, I mean, this seems rare that somebody in, in one field would do both. But to me, we are always so digital that that's why you're so inspiring to me. Because now I don't have to, um, I'm like, oh, wow, I could put, do something on uh, with paper and cut it out or do something. So, but is that unique for the printmaking field? I, I think, I mean, there's a lot of printmakers doing a lot of different things. I think they tend to think in one um, media at a time. So if it's a woodcut, they plan the image to be a woodcut and it's gonna be a woodcut and it lives as a woodcut and it's just woodcut. Um, which is not a, a bad way of working, but I think there's a tendency to be kind of one-minded about what you're using. I, I do know a lot of people who use Photoshop for screen prints and for digital processes they don't necessarily combine them with other ways of making. So mm -hmm. I, I think I am a little bit unusual because I'm not, they're not traditional prints most of the time. Usually my prints are a collage of some sort and I've brought in different kinds of printmaking. Um, now, of course, you can find people that do <laughs> combine things, but I think the tendency is to be a little bit like, this is a woodcut and it will be a wood, you know, a little bit more dry back. Um, some people use photo, like I said, Photoshop is mostly used for um, screen print and some for lithography. I use Photoshop when, even when I'm planning etchings. Um, I just use it to stick things together that, because it's, it's fast in the computer. I can do it by hand, but I can do it faster in Photoshop. And so it's just, it's just a tool. This gets me to the next step a little bit faster, I think. Sometimes. I don't know if this this one is digital or not. It's both actually. So um, if you each color is its own plate, and so looking at just the um, lighter blue, the teal, I have photoshopped all those leaves together into that massive stuff. They're from scanned plants, and I've changed the size of them quite a bit, and then you know just kind of stuck it together. From there, I've um, printed out the image on a film and expose it to a photopolymer plate so that that plate prints with regular printmaking ink. You know, I have to scrape ink on it and wipe it down and run it through the press just like I would any other regular etching. Um, in this case, I've printed two on top of each other, the light blue and the dark blue. I've printed them on one piece of paper together and then I've secured that to the bigger white piece around it. So it started in Photoshop as like a test image to see how things would end up and it eventually I just said, hey, that looks pretty good. Let's see, let's see what happens when I make this into a real plate. So That's yeah. cool. Oh. Yeah. So talk about, because like some are full color and you're coloring it in. This really was just done with two different colors of ink. So how does working with a limited color palette um, when you're printing, how does that help you? Um, how does it help you define the scope of the project or the direction of the project? Because as a designer, sometimes that's all our client can afford 
or now digital printing makes it so easy, but sometimes using only two colors really helps it to come out more. Like this in all four colors or with tons of different colors may not be as powerful to me as, as this piece is as it is right now. Yeah, I tend to choose a color palette kind of early on and stick to it. It helps me um, helps me define the project. I don't I've printed this in reds and it's a totally different feel. Um, so it's not that I plan which colors they're gonna be so far in advance like this has to be blue, but once I've once I've decided that it's going to be a certain way, it helps me figure out which pieces to combine it with or what the next step is. Um, and it's a little bit of a challenge in some ways. Um, how can I create a piece that's bold and exciting in the color blue? Or how can I create a piece that is calming and ethereal in the color blue? Um, it just, I don't know, it, it's just kind of a challenge. Um, I don't know why I choose the colors I do. I just choose it like it's a gut reaction. Like I'll see the form and say this has to be, you know, blue, and then I just kind of follow that as I as I go along. And I can add, I do add when I'm collaging. I'll add smaller bits of other colors. So up close, my my collages are very much kind of rainbow looking. Like every color is in there, but the greater scope is like a signature color for that piece. And I usually refer to them like in progress, like a red, oh, that's the red piece, or that's the blue piece. So Gotta this looks, this is like an in progress piece for the branched, which I'll talk about. Yes. So it looks like you printed in like an orange and they look like orchids or something. So talk about your, your this, I mean, it they start with these organic botanical pieces, but then they come like these sea creatures to me or yeah. they have more, <laughs> they have Something. a different life <laughs> yeah so this yeah. particular piece is all flower they started off all flowers so the the blobby shape towards the bottom the kind of that rust color those are um, bearded irises and then there's some on the right hand side there's some like finger looking things kind of shooting off to the side those are echinacea woven in there are some daffodils and some daisies and some other little flowers like the actual flower image um it's about five feet tall i believe and almost four feet wide um so i this particular piece i said i'm going to make a piece that has only flowers in it i'm going to see what happens when i only use flower imagery not leaves not sticks not seeds you know only flowers and i just started printing flower tons of flowers and some of them kind of made the cut and ended up on here. Um, I I didn't know exactly what the final piece was going to look like. I just knew that it was going to have flowers, and I kind of picked that gold, orange, red, and there's a little bit of green kind of palette. And so that once you get further on, it's it's kind of a yellow piece. It has a lot of gold colors in it. So I printed in those colors. I printed in a lot of rust colors, some browns, some greens. Maybe in that same family. So there might be some um, like blue greens in there, but they're warmer colors, so I can kind of mix them with the gold later on. So the, the exterior line work is the printed ink color that I've, that these are all lithos. And the interior colors, wherever it's like a solid tone, that's hand coloring usually. So I've painted with watercolor or acrylic or one of those. Let's see if I can bring up this one. This one's a little bit um, a different angle, but you can see the colors a lot better. So then yeah. this was more finished, I think. Way more finished and everything starting to get, um, it takes several layers of coloring to get this kind of vibrancy. So really thin washes, really light layers of color and then build up. So wherever it's bright yellow, it's probably like three or four layers at least. Um, and they get they get darker and they start evolving. You know, there's some like really dark blues kind of at, at the top. I don't know how mm -hmm. that ended up there. They just kind of like grow on their own. I let oh. I let them decide in a way. Not that they have, you know, 
and let them kind of evolve and like be their own things and try not to talk it to them feels, too much. It yeah. feels right in a certain spot, but maybe not in something else. So you really just go with your gut a lot of times. You just let yourself play. Totally spur of the moment. I the the final pieces are never planned out. Like I, I never really know what they're gonna be until I get there. And I like I said, I change my mind a lot and I just kind of will let them evolve. I let them like grow naturally. Pun intended. So because they're all natural. If you change so. if you change your mind a lot, how do you know when you're done? Almost everything is never done, but I do have <laughs> deadlines. Yeah, I have deadlines, and if I don't stick to them a little bit, um, I would I would never get anywhere. Um, this piece, I would love to make parts of it darker so that they pop more. Um, yeah, so I guess sometimes I guess I'm done when I can't make up my mind too much. You know, if the, if the decisions aren't coming quickly, if I if I'm not able to stick to anything right away, then I'm I'll just be done with it it's just it's just too much to figure out what the next step is then I, I just I just finish so again these are really big but as you they're amazing zoomed in like if you if you go to the Flickr thing you can just scroll over on that thing and then there's a, a link at the top you can just click on that I think you can maybe click on the picture I don't yep if you just click anywhere on the picture it takes you and then in Flickr, you can zoom in. And I don't know if you guys are doing this while we're talking, but um, oh, great. Now I'm just in, uh, I'm just in Flickr full screen. Um, I went away for a second. So um, hopefully I was still here talking, but you were. Anyway. You were. <laughs> but you know, you can go in different windows. So I encourage you guys to zoom in on some of these because to me, I mean, it's just amazing like it is, but then to know all that work that came in. And I think it's, to me, that what we can use as designers from this is letting it go, letting it just build on something and letting it be about um, this just shape and texture and, and color. So hopefully, I think that. There's one more in process of this one, I believe. And there yeah. you see your drink, your Starbucks drink probably because yes, I know coffee you. <laughs> and your computer yeah. your um, watercolor box with everything and then there's tons of colored pencils so this really shows and and these pieces like the irises they look I mean about the same they're, size as a a pen yeah they're a little bit smaller they're actually cell phone cell phone size approximately okay. tall they're not very big um, and the whole thing, like I said, is about five feet. So they're, you know, a little bigger than my hand, a little bigger than my hand, or a little smaller than my hand. <laughs> and um, and they're stacked on top of one another. So that gives it um, a thicker, like, look on the paper that you don't necessarily see on the more opaque um, right. feeling on the paper. So in the and every little like, every little lobe, every little like petal has been cut out of a piece of paper and glued in that spot. So great craftsmanship. And you're actually most of the time using scissors. Yeah, I I could never get exacto knives to work for me. But also with scissors, I can sit and I can watch a movie at the same time. I can have a cup of coffee with somebody. I mean, that might be a little strange. I've done it, you know, like where I can sit there and work and engage in something else instead of always just looking down and holding this thing. Um, also, I think they're more portable in some ways. You know, like I throw a couple pairs of scissors in my bag, a couple bags of things to cut out, and I can go. Um, and I, I use the big scissors. You know, I use regular scissors. I don't use little tiny craft scissors. Yes. I use regular full size scissors. That's amazing. I always thought you had small scissors. Not like yeah. cutting baby toenail scissors, but like, you know, like smaller scissors. Yeah, like the little craft scissors. I think they're too small. My fingers are too long for them, so I can't really. It's more awkward than it's worth. <laughs> well, that's good. You got great hand yeah. muscles, then, I guess. From oh, all that. After okay. all that cutting, yeah, you would you would hope that I could 
<laughs> so here's some others that are more, I think uh, these are black and white, but you let me know. Yeah, so these, Maybe this Photoshop. is Photoshop. It, it started off in Photoshop, and this is another instance where I liked what I was doing in Photoshop. I mean, I was just playing around with some of that texture and some of these pieces. Um, I, I think it just started as a, well, let's just kind of see what these things look like together. It wasn't um, necessarily intended to be a final piece, but then I liked it. So I made it into a, a photopolymer plate. So I printed it out of Photoshop. I exposed it to this plate. So wherever the black lines are have been etched into this plate. And then I printed it like a normal etching. This one's only four inches wide by six, six inches tall. So it's it's very small, especially when you compare it to the one where I, you know they're feet wide and feet tall. And I just do these things so I can get something else done. To you know I can get my arms around another image without having to do so much to get the bigger pieces out. Um, right. Like. I mean, I do them in between the big pieces. I I need to have some some small breathers, and so I do them with small little pieces. But it sounds like a lot of them start out as studies, like these were tests. These weren't necessarily something. Yeah. And then oh, definitely this was a study. This never meant to be to see outside of the computer. I meant it only as uh, a tool for myself to figure out the image, to figure out those shapes. I had every intention of blowing these shapes up and draw, redrawing them by hand and making them into plate, each little section into plates and maybe seeing how they look like on a bigger scale. But I, I just like this one. And so I, I'm okay with letting my studies be real things eventually. You know, sometimes like the things that I don't plan end up being the best things. Which I think well, I think that different. It pushes you in your art to now, ooh, I could do this. And so it is so fast to do something in Photoshop. What it tells me as a designer, I can sit back and say, okay, I need to do more playing studies. I need to just take something either in Photoshop and just play with it. Maybe it's type or maybe it's textures. I really like some of the textures that you're using, you know, all the things, but just have a limited power. I mean, you're really using botanicals um, a ton. Yes. And you know, that's another way you limited yourself, but in a way, by limiting yourself, you've been able to, I mean, sometimes you can't, if you're going to go to the gym, you can't use every piece of equipment. I mean, you'd be there for forever. You know, you right. got to say, okay, I'm going to do the pool today. So I think that's such a, we need to limit ourselves, but we also need to play. And that's what this tells me about you. And for me to put into my own process is I need to spend time playing. And you know I probably don't spend enough time playing. No, you know I me. don't think. Yeah, I don't think you play enough. But <laughs> I. But this I is the work for me. Yeah, like I when I go into the studio and I'm just messing around with different images or textures or whatever. I mean that's work, but it's also uh, playing and experimenting because I I'll never get the images how I want them to be unless I don't try everything else first. I mean, if it's going to take me 10 tries, you know, those first nine experiments might lead me down a different path, but they're just as important as the final project. Um, and sometimes they, you know, I kind of like this little print, and it, I think it's, it's gotten in some shows, some other, you know, like it, it's got its own little life to live, even though it's very small. Yeah, but like your other pieces are, they are small little pieces too, That but this one you just happen to do in Photoshop instead of physically yeah. cutting it all out. So talk about your botanicals, this interest. Have you always had this? Were you just surrounded with plants? Was Laurie just inundating you with house plants as a kid? Um, it's my dad, actually. My dad is quite the gardener, and I spent a lot of summers outside um, helping him a little bit. Um, <laughs> and I'm just, you know, again, no pun intended, I'm naturally drawn to plants in the outside and, and natural forms. Um, it just, it's just what I do. You know, some people work with the figure, some people work with abstraction. I just, I'm drawn to these natural plant, mostly plant-based and not always forms. 
so they kind of evolve. You know, sometimes I throw insects in there, and sometimes they're microscopic images. But lately, they've been all about plants, and I'm kind of a plant fiend now. Like if you saw my apartment, I've probably got too many <laughs> plants. I'm a crazy plant lady, but it's better than cats. Way better than cats. Um, it's just you know, it's just what I do. It's what I'm interested in. I, I don't know. It's kind of it's just my thing, you know, like I can't, I don't necessarily explain it. I haven't had myself psychoanalyze to see why I do the things I do, but I'm, I'm sure that dad has a big, you know, influence on that. And it's what we connect about, you know, I, I get to talk to him about plants and he grows them, I draw them, you know. So like this piece over here was a ton of plant pieces, I believe. Then it became like this insecty kind of under. For me, it looks underwater. And there was one piece that you created last year. I think it was during fall semester, maybe that was really like sea creature like. So that they kind of have these pins to them. But I love that. So can you talk about this piece a little bit? Yeah, this this started off just like the previous piece as just an experimentation. Uh, there's this. There's this Dutch artist from the 1700s who made this diagram of plants and they're all stacked one on top of each other and he drew them to look like they were all part of one plant, but they're actually, you know, they can't possibly part, be part of one plant. Like, it's like he stuck them all together to make this diagram. So I was trying to do my own version of that. So there's these ferns at the top and then there's some pines and some um, stamens stuck in there and more pine. And then, you know, I was flipping through all of my images and I found that great squid. So I just popped the squid on the bottom of it just to see what would happen. And, you know, I think it really, it really works. Um, a lot of my images look like underwater images. I love the water. It's not intentional. They just kind of end up that way. I think it, part of it is the way they kind of float and float through space. They don't, um, they're not angular, they don't, there's no sense of gravity, so they tend to look like they're floating in water. Um, this one obviously has a squid, so that looks more sea creature than the rest of them, but it, it just came out of experimentation. It, and this was just my version of experimenting with somebody else's idea, but with, you know, my own stuff, my own plants, my own, well, not my own squid, but, you know. Right. Just, yeah, so, just experimentation. So where do you go? Do you, I mean, obviously you, you're not driving to your dad's uh, that often. Your parents' house no. is a little far to drive now. California, Alabama, a few, few days drive there. So where do you go for inspiration? Yeah, I, I don't get outside as much as I should, but I do take trips to parks or, um, you know, anywhere I can find outside. I've been going out on the, the bayou a little bit in Mississippi just to see what's out there. I also look online quite a bit. Um, Alabama has a um, a library of plants that are um, native to this area. A lot, and actually a lot of states have these like historical botanical societies or contemporary even botanical societies where they just have pictures upon pictures upon pictures of plants with the native name, you know, where they grow, if they're natives of the area, um, the Latin name. So I can trove online for days. Um, Google is a great search. So if I'm looking for a particular type of violet, I'll just type it in and, you know, four million images will come up. And I don't necessarily steal those, but I'll download them and then I'll redraw them myself or I use them as a reference photo. Um, there's quite a few scientific um, plant databases that you can find just, just by simple Googling. Um, and I use those all the time. You know, if I need a different, if I've been working with magnolia flowers lately and I need a different angle, I can troll through those databases and find six different magnolia flowers that will work for my purposes or at the right angle or whatever it is. Um, Do you think and I, I, you I, can... I like it 
Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Can you send me like a link to some of those databases? Because then I'll put it on the designrecharge.org, the where this is. Uh, is there? Not you don't have to do yeah. it right now. You can do it later, and I'll put okay. it on the show. I'll, yeah, yeah <laughs> I I've got a list of them actually ready to go. A student asked me a couple weeks ago about them, so I'll I'll send you that list when I'm done. Tons of stuff out there. Okay, good. So how uh, I know you're sketching so you're sketching these individual pieces you're um, so like to me this piece is amazing but how do you decide not to put color on it um, if I'm planning it for to make it into a plate if I'm gonna make it into a printmaking plate I won't put color on it because the color will come through the ink you know, like it, the color will be decided whatever ink I'm going to use. So I just plan them black and white. This particular one, I was using um, sketches and drawings that I had already had. So they were already in black and white that I had scanned in. So they were all ready to go like that. The color usually doesn't come until later when I'm putting the pieces together. And there are rare occasions, like this is a rare occasion where it's just the one etching. It doesn't have any added color to it. But it, that's part of like the whole process. Like I, I make things in the plates and I collage and I color later. So this is just at one part of the process. It didn't quite make it through the whole process. You know, it just it looks okay how it is. So I let it be. Um, and I, I think we can learn from that by saying, let's just work in one color and see if we have to add something because I feel like it it felt finished with just in black and white like it it didn't yeah. need anything extra like if you added extra maybe it would take away from some of the power of the piece and I think as designers we may tend to use uh, full color images when we could do the same thing with black and white or we could do the same thing with a desaturated or a monotone image that was all one color and maybe we need to push ourselves in that method um, yeah, I kind of I mean, I, go ahead. <laughs> I tend to start with one color and I start in one place and I let it grow from there, but I'm not afraid to stop that process along the way. So, it, you know, start with one color, build up the form, then add color, and then add more color and more pieces. I don't, you know, not everything I do has to be super collage and super colored and super layered. Sometimes it's okay for me to stop that train super early. And just let it be, I, let it grow, let it do its own thing on its own. But I, I think a lot of people don't do that. Like a lot of people are like, this is the process, I have to finish. And you're fine, yeah. you're very flexible, which I think again makes you unique, which is the thing I love about you. But it, uh, you are like, okay, well, it's finished here instead of continuing on. And maybe you do in Photoshop or whatever you do coloring or you do another test and you're like, no, nope, it's not it. It, that's not what I want to do and you are able to stop and that's that question of how you know it's finished and I loved your answer but you know it's a that's something I think as designers we're so anal I mean and my goodness if you saw some of this stuff up close you know uh, Megan's a little anal too with her cutting um, <laughs> and all that I mean that's so much process but you get that out in in part of it you get that really anal part out that you let it for me, one of the things that's kind of anxiety ridden for doing collage is that it won't be perfect or I won't know when to stop or whatever. But you're so perfect on your drawings and your sketches and then your prints. So, so those are perfect. And then you cut them out and they're perfect. So we, it's okay. And then you go to this and you let, you're able to play. Like it's not, you don't, you've been so perfect over here. You can really flow, let it go here. And I think that's really unique. Well, I, I think a lot of my pieces are a lot less perfect than you think they are, but I'm okay with it. Like, I think, you know, maybe I'll slip, um, accidentally snip a couple petals off a daisy, and so it's, you know, it's not perfect daisy anymore, and I can't, I'll just use it anyway, because who's going to know if I've got a, you know, a couple hundred pieces on a big collage? Nobody's going to know, and nobody's going to know what my intentions were, right? So I, I guess I'm just... You know, I'm really tight in some areas, I'm really loose in other areas, and I, I have to juggle that all the time. Like, you know, sometimes I can fixate on, on things too much, just like anybody can. 
but I'm also, I think, willing to just let it go, just be okay with it, you know, it's not always going to be perfect, so, it, you know, I won't let it be perfect, it, I think it's just fine to not be perfect. So oh, one other thing I, <laughs> I think is neat is that your paper is kind of translucent when you put the glue mm -hmm. on it, and so you can kind of see, you build up these layers like that, and that way might be something else designers could do is, is use that opacity um, and use the transparency in InDesign or in Photoshop. Use that more as a, as a tool instead of just saying, oh, it's 100% and we always leave it like that. I mean, that's the default, so we tend to do that. But you are defaulting at a thin rice paper kind of paper so that it yes. always lets you be more transparent. Almost all the papers I print on are like at least 50% transparent. And if I want them to go more opaque, I have to make, I have to push them or fill them in more to get that. So I, I get this physical layering that is pretty nice. You know, different shapes come out as I put these half opaque, half you know, see-through images on top of one another. Um, even when I'm working in Photoshop, I'm usually working at 50% opacity, just so I can see what what images kind of come through, and I'll you know erase little parts of them if I want it to be opaque. Or um, it, it's just something that kind of naturally evolved in my process. Like I started using these thin papers because they glued down so nicely, and one of the benefits and the, one of the one of the things that is you know, my work is known for is that translucency. And so I just kind of let it go, let it be. And I mean, it makes her cutting to be a little bit more difficult, but you know, you just never, you never know what's going to happen when you mix two things like that. I agree with Anne doing, um, you know, building up like we do with type, but instead of making it so opaque, make it more transparent so this is a piece or i don't know where your thing is it's over here it's over there yeah to me. um oh wait yeah <laughs> yeah yeah um what would you like this is you haven't glued this down because i see a shadow right yeah so there's some really faint um pencil lines in the background on this one then nothing else has been glued down at this point so they're they're just kind of floating on top of the page and I'll do this for hours upon hours upon hours. I just kind of shift all of the pieces around until they, until I'm ready to glue them down. Um, and that's how I play. Like I'll, it's so much faster to like physically put things next to each other um, or on top of one another. So when you see my space, I've got like these paper pieces everywhere. It's kind of chaotic, but that that's just me kind of like mad scientist, like you know putting stuff together. So at, at this particular so, point, nothing's been glued down. And the coloring, it looks like it's all, that's just the printing color, right? You haven't, or have those green pieces been colored? No, at this point, it's all the, the printing color, the whatever ink I was using, and the difference in the paper. So some of those papers are a little bit more cream colored than, than the bright white. Mm. So no, no hand coloring at this point, just, just paper and and then you're kind of drawing this in pencil. And is it watercolor paper you're using? What kind of paper are you getting that's this big long paper or these big pieces? Uh, the ground paper, the substrate paper, it, it's actually printmaking paper that a lot of drawing um, people use. It's called Reeves BSK. It's the mm -hmm. standard go-to printmaking paper. You know, all of my students buy it, buy the 100 pack. Um, it's a really durable paper. It, it does a lot of things. It can handle watercolor, it can handle color pencils. Um, is that how you spell it? It is. Yeah, that's how you spell it. It's really durable. So if I change my mind and want to spritz it, and I, I can pull paper out from it, or I can restretch it, you know, it, it just it holds up well. I abuse it pretty, pretty well. So <laughs> it's got to be. Gotta be thick enough and you know tough enough to withstand all the things I'm going to do to it. So these next pieces, because we're running out of time, um, mm -hmm. but I sure am excited. Uh, oh, prepping the paper, stretching on the board. Okay, mom. Right, that's your mom. Yeah. Oh yeah, I have it moved. Hold on. 
Oh, I'm sorry. So she said, can you talk about prepping the paper, stretching it on a board? Yeah, I, um, I, I stretch it just like watercolor paper. So I get the whole thing wet and then I tape it down with strapping tape to a board that's larger than paper. So when I'm working on the big pieces, I've got a, a four by eight board in my living room. I mean, that's my kitchen table and my work table all in one. And so I, I tape everything down so that that bottom piece can't warp. It stays perfectly flat. Um, and it, it makes it also, like, if I'm using a board where I'm transporting things, it makes it easier if they're already taking place. So this is part of that same piece that we were I was showing before. Yes. And now you, so that, this is the drawing, right? You've painted in the drawing? Yeah, that on the left hand side, there's that kind of river looking piece. That's all watercolor. And then the, the leaves sprouting out of it are collage pieces of paper. So they're, that thin paper is pretty seamless. So it, it kind of blends the two together. You don't really know what's drawing, what's print, and what's collage. Unless you're right, like, inches away from it. And that's another reason why I use that thin paper is because I can kind of mask whether it's, you can't tell if they're drawn on there or if they're collaged on there or, or what. But I like that, um, I like the flexibility. I can fake it a little bit, you know, without, well, now everybody knows. But <laughs> right, yeah, that's it's good. It's not a secret anymore. <laughs> yeah. So these are some great questions. Is, if anybody else has some questions, I'm willing to go a little over because we started a little late, two minutes. So I'm going to pull up some more images to kind of get you. This is another in progress. And you called this rope growth, but I think it was called something else. I think I ended up calling it river vine at the end because of that. That river-like shape is actually based on the Sacramento River that kind of flows near my house. So I took a map and I. I traced the map for the river and then I transported it to this piece of paper and then decided that it needed to have stuff growing out of it. Apparently. Cool. Leaves and, and there's some shells actually that kind of towards the bottom right, there's a shell piece that looks like it's going to get. Yep. Glued down. So this, I don't know if this is the end or not. Um, yeah. Or if this is just the end process. Oh, this is the uh, final. Yeah. Okay. It's very close to the final. Cause it's, yeah. I think I added a few more little things to it. But I'm trying all my to pieces go have back. so many all my pieces have so many little tiny bits to them. Even I get confused about when things you know, like I and I look things up so many times that like I try to keep track and I try to take pictures as I go along to kind of I like to look back and see what I did and how I got there, but you know, even I lose track about like when I've glued things down or when it's done or if it's done mm -hmm. or all those things. So there's one more. I do too, and and they're huge. You'll um, I mean, some are seven feet by six feet or something. Seven feet by like huge. four. Four over seven, yeah. Four, I think seven, that one. Yeah. Yeah, no. It's still bigger than a bread basket, so. <laughs> but now she's working a little bit smaller, so. But there, I mean, it's still 26 by, or 24 by 36 or something. Something like that, yeah. Which is like a poster for us designers. That's like a standard poster size. So there's one more image I wanted to bring up. And was this in Photoshop? Yeah, it started in Photoshop, and then I made it into an etching plate. So it, it went from Photoshop, and I printed out the film directly from my printer, and then I burned it into a printmaking plate. So I'll, wherever it's black, it's been etched away. And it's, um, I think it's like almost six inches by eight inches. It's not, you know, it's not very big at all. So Anne had a question about um, how do you manage the large size? Is it on the floor? Is it hanging on the wall? When it's in my, when I'm working on it at the studio, it's on a four by eight board that I tape down 
and like I, I let it you know live there until I'm done with it. The, when I'm done with them, I roll them up on a giant tube. You can get these quick tubes at you know Home Depot or Lowe's. They're concrete forms, and they're about um, eight to twelve inches in diameter or across. You know they're they're really big, and I'll wrap the the paper around the outside. Um, so it's a wide enough tube that it won't crease the paper, and actually, it it won't really even curl the paper that much, especially because I've glued so much stuff to it. The layers of paper and glue kind of make it spring back to flat all the time. So I'll ship them in tubes. You know, they're on their side. They're rolled up on this tube that's maybe four feet tall, and I buy these bags or these boxes that they ship um, golf clubs in. You know, apparently that's a thing, and you can buy a box for it. So the, I ship them in that, and then when I put them up on the wall, I use magnets that I've painted white. And I've built frames for these pieces. I built a frame. I built frames for my thesis show at this size, but I, it was too much to ship them back to to Alabama with me. I mean, the frames are even bigger than the pieces. Like the piece is seven feet, the frame is eight feet, and it's just it's not convenient. I don't have the room for that in my in my apartment. So I use magnets. Um, I I just sink There's two screws thinny, into the wall. Little thin yeah. magnets. Let's see. They're really strong too. Yeah. Apparently I can't get it off. So out. they're so they're really thin. This is actually double the thickness is what I usually use. They're less than the circumference of a of a dime. Maybe like at least half the thickness. They're super small. They're um, rare earth magnets. You know, it really for a, a seven foot piece of paper, it really only takes like seven to ten of these magnets, and it will stay for a long time. They're super super strong. So you know, when they're at my house, they're rolled up on a tube, and when they're out in the world in a gallery, they're held up with magnets and. It's still kind of a process. They're still like, you know, what am I going to do with that eight foot piece? But roll back up on the tube. Hope that they're all going to be okay together. Right. So I'm going to share your website. So this is uh, one more Megan and M E G A N, not any crazy spelling of Megan. And it's also over here uh, in the queue. And then, um, so if you want to get in touch with her, that's the best way to kind of connect with her. Mm -hmm. And um, and if you've enjoyed today, hopefully you come back. We have an episode every week. We try to do all kinds of different things that designers, um, freelancers, anybody who's trying to not just be in a box, I guess. And hopefully this helps us to connect with each other. I know I've connected with many people who are here, and I'm so glad you guys came. If you guys have any questions, type them in real quick, and we'll get to them while I get through the last part of my normal spiel. Um, if you want to contact me, the best way to do that is to get on my email list, and you can get on it on designrecharge.org. Um, you can always email me at diane at designrecharge.org. You can also connect with me on Facebook, and, and you'll get to meet her at CCAC this year, just so you know. Oh, yeah. And then CCAC. on Instagram, and on Twitter, I have two handles, and I use both of them. So you can get me at, at Design Recharge and then also at Diane Gives AU. Yeah, I'm excited and for you guys to meet Megan. So thank you, you all, for coming. Um, thank you for watching, and hopefully you guys got something out of it. I know I did. Megan, you're, it's, I hope you guys go on Flickr and like zoom in on these things because they're amazing. And you can always just click. You can go back and watch the replay um, to do that. But thank you, Aunt Karen, for coming, right? Uh, I think that's yeah. Megan's aunt. And then her mom um, um, and whoever our guest is. I appreciate it. And everybody else besides Carol, you're new to me. But everybody else I know, I've seen you before. So it's nice to see you. And I'm glad you guys come. And I hopefully will see you. Next week, and Meredith will have to, you'll have to let me know how you're building the, um, your vacation in Tennessee was, right? So, um, oh yeah, maybe she'll bring some. Oh, she'll definitely have her scissors and her baggies. <laughs> Not on the plane, though. Probably. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys. We'll see you next week at 2.30, and then the week of July 4th, I'm taking the week off. So, 
thank you guys again. And Megan, I can't thank you enough. And I'll thank see you. you in a minute because I'll see you out in the big room. Okay. Bye. Bye.